This is the Daily Tech News for January 17th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Once again, I am out recording sword and laser video shows, but you are filling in. Thank you so much. You guys did a great job yesterday, and I know you're going to do a great job again. Uh, thanks for coming in on Friday and helping me out uh, today. I am not here. I'm recording the sword and laser videos, but if you're, if you're wondering, if you missed yesterday's show... I got tons of people, some friends, some new friends, some listeners, listeners who are friends, all kinds of people sending in reports and good, good feedback to share with you guys today. So that will be our discussion section. Uh, there are a couple of headlines in the news I want to tell you about. So here they are. Ars Technica reports U.S. President Barack Obama announced plans to reform the intelligence gathering practices of the National Security Agency. While most practices will not change, the president ordered the NSA to immediately seek FISA court orders before accessing telephone metadata. The NSA will only pursue data that is two steps from a terrorist organization rather than three. By March 28th, the NSA also must have a plan other than holding the metadata themselves. The president also plans to appoint an outside panel of experts experts to act as public advocates in FISA cases, limits to gag orders after receiving a national security letters, and extended rights for non-citizens, including heads of state of other countries, are also planned. Google has joined several other efforts to create smart contact lenses. Google's effort is similar to Microsoft's from 2011 in that it is meant to monitor glucose levels by checking the tears, which could be helpful for diabetics. Microsoft showed off a similar project in 2011. In fact, TechCrunch reports Babak Parvis, a former University of Washington professor, worked with Microsoft on that project. Other companies are making contact lenses that use tears to power fuel cells and measure the eye for glaucoma patients. Could Nintendo be planning a phone? Hard to say. Bloomberg reports Nintendo president Satoru Iwata said the company is considering a new business structure after disappointing holiday sales of the Wii U led to a forecast of a 25 billion yen loss for the year. Iwata said, quote, given the expansion of smart devices, we are naturally studying how smart devices can be used to grow the game player business. It's not as simple as enabling Mario to move on a smartphone. All right, that's a quick look at some of the news today, but let's get to another field report from Darren Kitchen. We had one of these from Darren yesterday from ShmooCon. Take it away, Darren. Hey, Tom, I'm back east for ShmooCon, the Washington, D.C.-based hacker conference, where this morning registration opened. We're eagerly awaiting some awesome talks from Rob Fuller, Bruce Schneier. Uh, and while the opening talk hasn't happened, another talk actually captivated the crowds this morning. And I'm talking about the one from our very own President Obama, who addressed the nation with his proposed intelligence reform. I mean, this to a nation needing greater you know, confidence and a world needing to rebuild trust. Uh, the speech reiterated the president's position that none of these intelligence programs have actually violated the law. And while success goes unreported, failure would be catastrophic. Uh, this, among a couple of other lines, really raised a few eyebrows amongst the crowd. Uh, one of these in particular, that programs to, quote, ensure that hackers don't empty your bank accounts. You, you see, unlike other conferences in, say, Las Vegas or the Midwest, ShmooCon caters particularly to the Beltway cyber defense contractors and other such spooks. So I must say the energy in the room wasn't actually unanimous as the president outlined his uh, points for reform. Under such reform, for instance, national security letters would actually expire after some time, meaning that we might even see them in, say, a Google transparency report. But then on the other hand, they still wouldn't require a court order. There's also a statement on restricting eavesdropping on foreign leaders and allies, such as German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Though it was made pretty clear that spying on foreign governments would continue and there's no apology whatsoever about the fact that the U.S. just does it better. I mean, overall, the conversation is getting presidential attention, and that's good. I mean, as Obama pointed out, quote, nobody expects China to have an open debate. And as Obama's remarks that he's not going to dwell on Mr. Snowden's actions or motivations, it's, it's still pretty clear that we wouldn't be having this debate without the actions of our whistleblower. Reporting from ShmooCon in Washington, D.C., I'm Darren Kitchen. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Darren. And, of course, if, if you want more Darren, check it out. He's usually on the show. Like, we often have him on on Fridays. But you can also find him all the time at hack5.org. That's H-A-K-5.org. All right, let's get into the part I'm really excited for. The news from you. These are the things that you've been sending in all week long. Thank you so much. Take it away, you. After Cisco Systems Incorporated CEO John Chambers put a $19 trillion figure on the Internet of Everything at the 2014 International CES show in Las Vegas, Cisco put on a presentation at the NRF, 
the National Retail Federation trade show in New York City, and reported that the Internet of Things represents a $1.6 trillion opportunity for retailers over the next decade, according to their estimates. Cisco estimates that there are about 1.5 trillion things globally, with only 10 billion connected. That means more than 99% of physical objects are still unconnected. Lisa Fretwell, Cisco's Internet of Everything Managing Director, is quoted as saying, Our experience in the last 12 months is, anything you can get an IP address to, we are able to get to. So I guess if you really like it, you can put an IP address on it. I just have a quick question. Internet of Things, why? I don't get it. Tell me why my thermostat needs to be connected to the Internet. Why does my toaster need to be connected to the Internet? What is having my refrigerator, my stove, my washer, my dryer? Why do I need to have my toothbrush connected to the Internet? What compelling reason is there? Data? Because data isn't helpful unless you have somebody to curate that. Uh, Look at the stuff that we're talking about with the NSA. They have all this data. Uh, to the point that it's it's copious amounts of data that they can't do anything with because they have so much of it. Uh, so I, I ask the question, why? I don't get it. Um, anyway, love the show, and um, look forward to hearing uh, more next week. Bye. Sequence all the things. That, according to the BBC, is the aim of Chinese company BGI. BGI's facility in Shenzhen, China, has become the world's largest genetic sequencer with over 150 sequencing machines. That's five times the number of the largest center in Europe. BGI is also using skilled labor and new manual cloning techniques to lower costs and increase yields. BGI is now producing 500 clone pigs a year for medical research, and they have plans to sequence the genomes of 1 million plants, animals, and people. BGI directs Dr. Wang Jun says that if a species has industrial use, tastes good, or looks cute, it should be sequenced. Quote, it's like digitizing all the wonderful species. Digitize me, Fred. I'm Chimera reporting for DTNS. Hello, Tom Merritt and the Daily Tech News Show audience. This is Adam Palowski. I'm calling to leave a comment about the ruling, the FCC rulings on net neutrality. Uh, Two big schools of thought going around about this is, one, because the FCC didn't classify Internet access as a utility but a communication service, this was the right thing to do. And I I am kind of agreeing with that. They may have uh, mispresented what this should have been. The other school of thought I'm seeing is, is that uh, folks are saying that, oh, no, this should have been struck down because what we really need is an open Internet and competition. Um, don't really think that's the answer. Um, I think we've seen time and time again that uh, Uber corporations left to their own devices are always looking to fill their pockets at the expense of their customers. Um, I do think maybe that the, there will have to be some new legislation. I'm of the opinion that they really should classify the Internet as a utility and have it treated as such what do the league of legends dos and f gwenifil stories have in common they both exhibit issues with weak links and security while using ntp to launch the dos against gaming servers might have been a new technique using tangential services as attack vectors is far from it ah twitter you are not alone as a service vulnerable to f gwenifil snafus Let's make it simple. When the account password gets changed, make the apps using the API re-authenticate. Pretty please? The more linked our systems become, the more important it is to make sure each link is as strong as it can be. Thanks, Redacted, for purposefully making weak links all along the chain. I would be remiss, though, to point out that according to frequent studies, it's likely that you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Hey, Tom, it's Veronica Belmont. Uh, Sorry I took you away from Daily Tech News Show uh, because you're up here in Petaluma recording sword and laser video with me. But hey, you know, we all got to work. But anyway, I am super excited about the Mars rock discovery. This is something that surprised scientists a couple of days ago. Uh, They noticed that the Mars rover was near this rock and they hadn't seen this rock before. And things just don't really just show up on Mars all that occasionally. Um, So there's kind of two going theories. One is that accidentally the Mars rover kind of brought the rock up from the soil while it was mid-turn and kind of shifted it, and now it's suddenly been flipped over. Or alternately, that 
it was somehow dropped there uh, via asteroid or meteorite or something like that. They're pretty sure that it was the Mars rover that did it. But the coolest part about this whole discovery is that for the first time, they get to see the underside of a rock that hasn't been exposed to the Martian atmosphere in literally billions of years. So they kind of get to see what was going on under the surface a little bit, especially by something that's been shielded for that long. Uh, so yeah, Mars rock, it's about the size of a jelly donut. I'm quoting that from the Discovery News article. Uh, delicious and interesting. Does your home router have a massive back door in it? It might do. A hacker called Eldon van der Bergen has found one in a number of Linksys Netgear and Cisco routers. He found the routers were listening on port 32764, which is strangely high for a port number. Further reverse engineering revealed a major back door that could lock you out of your own router. Scary. If you want to check to see if your router is affected, head over to Steve Gibson's port scanner at bit.ly slash port 32764. Cisco has already released a fix for this exploit. My question is, who put it there in the first place? Scott Ryan here from Columbus, Ohio. It looks like 3D printing has made another jump into the mainstream. In Gadget, The Verge, TechCrunch, Slashdot, Giko, and everyone else is reporting that Adobe is adding 3D printer support for both MakerBot and Shapeways within Photoshop. This additional file format and printing capability does not look like it is making Photoshop a viable 3D modeling environment, but will allow people to gussy up their models prior to printing them out. 3D printing will be truly mainstream when we can print a 3D model from MS Paint, but we are one step closer. That's it for me. Please check out my website at 20questionstuesday.com. See why I make a loan to Mirepoix analogy. That is 20questionstuesday.com. Thank you. Today I would like to discuss this new Windows nine operating system that Paul Thorat reported on his super site for Windows website. Given the current trend towards mobile ubiquitous computing environment, if you buy into the idea of the next decade bringing us what is called contextual computing, then this direction of Windows 9 and moving away, moving away from the metro, modern, or whatever they're calling it today, interface and putting the apps back on the desktop could be a risky move. There seems to be a lot of trending evidence showing movement towards contextual computing like mobile devices, tablets, and now the Internet of Things. We're talking about true contextual computing, not networking or multitasking, where devices operate independent of the uh, computer. Examples of this include the Nest thermostat, the Protect smoke detector, as these devices have become not only aware of their environment, but of each other. These devices do not require traditional desktop operating systems to operate. Apple and Google are headed towards this contextual computing environment and jockeying for position to aggregate the data to maintain and grow the market share. What I like about Windows 8.1 specifically is its ability to become that transitional crossover or bridge to get us closer to this new way of computing. Microsoft is also in a good position to create the same enterprise side crossover systems to transition us into this uh, hybrid cloud stage. That should ease the corporate environment into contextual computing support systems. The question I have is, are we reaching a tipping point where Microsoft could lose their competitive edge when all users are moving towards these mobile and contextual computing appliances in the post-PC world? This is Steve for Steve's Tech Review on YouTube, signing out for the Daily Tech News Show. Hi, Tom. Uh, Carl here from uh, New York. Um, love the show. been watching you all the way back from 2143, actually back to BOL. Anyway, um, I did make the change from T-Mobile, from AT&T to T-Mobile, and T-Mobile didn't care what phone I gave them. I could have given them an older phone. The problem I had with the T-Mobile, with the AT&T phones was they just locked down the service. So it meant that I couldn't transfer that over. I looked for a couple of things that would allow me to do that without going through AT&T, and they just simply wouldn't do it. So I finally just sold back the phones. It wasn't the best price, but it was a decent price, and it got me on my way. Made that switch that day, had the phones back up pretty quickly, and overall pretty happy. Um, Glad to see that there is some competition going on. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Um, talk to you. See you later. Bye. Popular security firm Symantec has been known for keeping you safe online, but this time they might help keep you safe while you use BitTorrent. According to TorrentFreak.com, last week the company filed for a patent application for a technology that aims to keep people safer while using the popular file sharing protocol. It will use a reputation system that tracks the trustworthiness of a file rather than the file itself, because after all you're still downloading it. It'll look at things like IP addresses of the seeders, torrent sites, torrent trackers, to make sure they're not associated with malware. Despite NSA stories, much of the government operates under more restricted rules than you might think. 
Many federal and military workers strive to be productive using only a desktop computer, collaborating on documents through email. Most cloud-based solutions are outright blocked due to security fears regarding where data is stored. Bring your own devices coming, but suffer from the stigma that if classified email is accidentally received on your personal device, you must then surrender it and never get it back. Clearly, device and cloud-based companies have more work to do to address federal IT concerns. As if the NSA didn't have enough problems to deal with, they have implanted software in nearly 100,000 computers around the world that allows the United States to conduct surveillance on those machines and can also create the possibility of launching cyber attacks. The technology, used since 2008, uses a covert channel of radio waves emitted by stealthily implanted circuit boards into USB cables of flash drives, which are then picked up by a briefcase-sized mobile unit miles away. Although there is no evidence of its use in the United States, critics say that using the technology undermines global confidence in a range of American-made tech and cloud service products. Hi, I'm Nathan Locke, and here's my roundup of the latest tech news in the UK. The BBC has launched a beta version of its enhanced connected red button service for Samsung, Sony, and LG smart TVs. Previously exclusive to Virgin Media TiVo boxes, the improved service makes use of a TV set internet connectivity to deliver information and video content without the need for separate applications. Viewers can access BBC content at any time, such as BBC iPlayer catch-up content, news, sport and weather updates. Finally, Instagram pictures reveal Belfast as the UK's happiest city. All you have to do is analyse the colours, facial expressions and the other objects in tens of millions of location tagged photos posted on Instagram. And it turns out that the happiest city in the UK is Belfast. And the happiest place there is a pub called The Parlour Bar in Elmwood Avenue. Why? Because the people in photos posted from around that location tend to be smiling and few look grumpy. The least happy place, meanwhile, turns out to be Salford, which comes below London and Bath in an analysis of 40 cities by Peter Warden, co-founder of the UK startup Jetpack, which provides guides of places to visit around the world based on publicly posted pictures. Warden analysed 100 million photos from Instagram's public system as part of the company's attempt to build a recommendation system built purely on pictures which are geotagged. Announced by Microsoft as a brand new limited edition wireless controller for the Xbox One based upon the Titanfall franchise. This limited edition wireless controller will be available worldwide in time for the launch of Titanfall on March 11th. This controller will retail for $64.99 and includes some beautiful designs lines, and much more. For the Daily Tech News Show, I'm Chase Nunes. I recommend you check out the Kickstarter-funded Mi PC. This device is poised to take over the living room by combining the functions of game console, media center, and fully functional family PC in a small form factor that would look right at home in anyone's credenza. At just $150, this device that combines off-the-shelf compatible controllers, runs XBMC and Plex, and has access to the full library of 300,000 other Android apps, is the perfect fit for a family looking for a media center, games console, and PC for their living room. I think this will compete directly with the entry level for Xbox One and Steambox, and I recommend for more information you check out Shannon Morse's first look at the Mi PC at CES on the Hack5 podcast. Hey Tom, this is Rob Reed giving you a shout. I just saw a fascinating article in Fortune. I'll send you the link. And it's about uh, the evolution of the cab market in San Francisco. And this is really specifically about the drivers. I think the undertold story for Uber, and passengers love Uber, and we talk about it all the time, is how empowering it's been for drivers. Um, this article cites one particular instance, one particular driver, who used to make $1,250 for a 50-hour work week when he was a cabbie, and now is an Uber X driver. He makes $1,500, about 20% more for 40 hours a week, about 20% less time. He has all this flexibility as well. And that's what I think is magnificent about digital technology in general and about ride sharing in less general, and particularly about Uber, which I know the best, is it's so empowering, not just for the passengers, but for the drivers as well. And the people who are trying like mad to resist this and using their entrenched power with local city councils aren't usually the cab drivers, it's the cab medallion holders for whom the drivers often work in almost feudal-like arrangements. And the fact that drivers are shaking free of that and able to connect directly with their passengers, I think is a really, really cool thing. It's an undertold story in the rideshare space. And this particular article in Fortune tells the story really well. So that's my tech story. 
Hey, Tom, Patrick calling in from France with a tech thought that we've actually uh, discussed in other venues. Um, but it has to do with mobile, uh, mobile computing and the app stores specifically. It's pretty obvious to us that we download and install programs from, uh, from app stores. But what occurred to me was that everyone's now doing it. It's not only uh, tech enthusiasts that are installing new programs. It's people like, you know, the, the, the moms and uncles and granddads of the world, which are now easily installing and downloading program and programs and that never used to happen before i mean in the days of windows 95 and and uh, windows xp uh, obviously you would be the person who would do that when uh, you would come over for um you know the holidays or stuff like that and now everyone's doing it easily and so it it's obvious to us but i really think it's being overlooked as one of the most important uh, contributions and and consequences of uh, the move to the post pc era so of course there are you know issues with these uh, app stores but still this this element this way of looking at it i think is kind of important so there you go food for thought Okay, we're almost done, uh, but I want to set up this last one just a little bit uh, because it's my old friend Russ Pitts. Russ and I, we worked together at Half Price Books in Austin in the 90s. We worked together at Tech TV. He's gone on to do great things at Polygon, uh, but what he has for you today isn't necessarily a news story, although it kind of is, and especially in light of the recent one-year anniversary of the suicide of Aaron Schwartz. I found this pretty compelling and pretty important to listen to. Go ahead, Russ. Last year, my wife and I founded a charity called TakeThis.org after a colleague of ours took his own life. He was feeling sick and didn't know who he could talk to. He didn't think there was anyone he could talk to, so he left us. Uh, that was a bad day, and my wife and I didn't want to lose any more friends, so we started TakeThis.org. Studies show one in four adults in the U.S. suffer, and technology fans, remember that infamous tech TV marketing phrase, who are smart, creative, and passionate are among the most susceptible to emotional issues. And not talking about their suffering opens people to more suffering, so we need to break that stigma. We're going to be announcing some major initiatives this year to increase awareness, education, and empathy regarding mental health. It's a big issue that we've been burying our heads in the sand over, and I think there are a lot of people who need to hear our message that it's dangerous to go alone. Takethis.org, big things, 2014, megapixels. That was, a, that was a tech reference. Thanks for your time. Maybe not the most fun thing to think about, but very important, and I'm really impressed with what Russ and the folks there are doing. So thank you for passing that along, Russ, an important message. And thanks again to all my guest hosts for filling in and uh, sending in these great reports. Really enjoyed hearing what all you guys had to say and the different perspectives. I hope we can keep an element of this going in the show as we move forward. This has really been fun. Also, special thanks to Katie Best and Jenny Josephson for editing and producing the News From You episodes. These would not have happened without them uh, assembling them. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, Monday, I will probably put a real short update in the feed. It's the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday here in the United States, so couldn't get any guests. A lot of people have the day off. Most people have the day off, uh, but we will be back with a full show on Tuesday, so don't miss that. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm scrambling around here to find the guest who is going to be Veronica Belmont. How could I forget? Veronica Belmont joins me on the show on Tuesday. Uh, and don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover every day at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can email us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And of course, our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll talk to you then. Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there.